Today, the giant TCR Advanced Zero that I purchased a few weeks back, I thought I'd take everyone through a six week update after 1500 kilometers of the bike. We'll go through top to bottom and check in how everything's holding up and a few tips and tricks I've learnt along the way. Okay, so the kilometre count on the bike at the moment is around 1,500 kilometres. That's included the Festive 500, which I just scraped the kilometres in for, uh, the National Championships here in Ballarat, riding around in the heat, over at the Tour Down Under for a week, riding in the hills and a lot of different terrain over there, and a week post that. So it's summer here, I've done a lot of Ks on the bike, I'm learning a lot more about it, and here's some things that I've learnt. First up, the bike hasn't let me down in any way, except for the time that I did brick the DI2 by upgrading with that wireless module and bricking that. No bike. So, out of the box following all procedures, we've currently got ourselves a single speed. But that was my fault. Off the shop floor itself, the bike's fine, wheels are good, things are rolling along, no major mechanicals or dramas with the bike, so it's been happy days there. The two modifications that I did make to the DI2 with the wireless module installation of the unit below the seat post and the climbing shifter were brilliant upgrades. They both haven't missed a beat once they were installed. In my first new bike video that I did, I did discuss the handlebars weren't quite right with my hands and getting the levers and hoods in the right spot. I did raise the bars a little bit up by about two millimeters. It was a very, very small modification. That has changed the ride entirely. I'm a little bit more comfortable with that. I may continue to tweak that. But again, small modification makes a big difference to the front end. A few questions have come in about the bar tape and the brand that I'm using on the Giant TCR. It's BBB Flex Ribbon Tape. I'll put a picture of it up here and I'll put links below to which bar tape that I'm using on the bike. It's nice and grippy, seems to work even when the bar tape is wet. And yes, I have got it wet riding through some uh, water parks the other day, but yep, nice and fine. Love the bar tape. I will be going back to that if I do unravel the bar tape when doing my next project. More on that soon. Onto creaks and rattles, have there been any? This is a press fit bottom bracket, it is a new bike, these things are inevitable, did it happen? Yeah, it did. But the one that I found, like, or the creak that I found on the bike, wasn't coming from the bottom bracket because it wasn't there in every single pedal stroke, it was just kind of random as I was riding along. Turns out it was the seat post, I removed the seat post, some carbon paste on the post itself, and then the post back in, no creaks since, so happy days there. Kind of to be expected on brand new bikes, but this is why a lot of shops do offer a six week or an eight week return to base free service option. The disc brakes themselves, yes, I am in love with the hydro disc brakes. As soon as you grab them in any scenario, either just straight into your first few minutes of the ride or bombing down a descent after 10 minutes or so of highly heated braking, you know what you're gonna get. There's no guesswork, there's no compensating for melting brake pads. They're there, they're consistent. Everything people say about them is true. Yesterday I switched back to the Giant TCR 2013 with rim brakes and ew, just wasn't the same. You can get used to it, and if it's the one bike that you ride with those brakes, it's fine, but give me hydro discs any day. It did take a few rides for the brake pads to bed in, for the braking performance to really start showing itself. So Rides with Japan, a YouTube channel that I'll link to below, has a really good video on how to bed in brake pads when they're brand new. I'll be following this procedure when I do my next set of brake pads. Links below to this video. One thing I do need to do with the brakes is adjust the reach and squishiness of the levers themselves. It's a bit too much squish before the brakes engage. And again, our friends over at Rise with Japan have an excellent tutorial on that. So I'll be studying that, links below, and then tinkering around with my setup to dial it straight in. Here's a tip for new players, including me, when it comes to these kind of bikes. The front brake caliper has a little bracket which mounted one direction allows for 140 mil front rotors. And if you flip it, you can actually install a 160mm front disc rotor for a little bit more braking performance. The TCR comes with 140s back and front, but if you want to flip over to 160 for a bit more brake performance on the bike, easy to do using that method. Now here's something that I wasn't aware of with road bikes and disc brakes, and I haven't heard anybody talk about it. I call it the front end squish or the front end wobble. If on a bike you grab the front brakes only and push the bike forward, you'll get a little bit of wobble. Now here's the difference between a standard road bike with caliper brakes, you can see here, not much movement there, 
Jumping over to the disc brake bike, and you can see there's a lot more wobble doing the front brake grab with a static back and forward test here. Now this isn't a problem, it's just a characteristic of where the brakes are now located. They were up the top there. Now the brake is located further down the fork and there's gonna be some play in there. So just be aware of that. I thought this may have been a problem bombing down a descent with the bike sort of wobbling around, but in reality, couldn't tell. Not a problem at all because you're not grabbing a handful of front brakes into those steep corners. Onto the wheels of the bike, and really, to be honest, I haven't paid much attention to the wheels. They haven't let me down, they're still rolling around, and they've been just fine. People have alerted me of a video discussing these wheels and how they're really poor and like riding through sand or whatever the reviewer was discussing, but for me, that's not my experience. They've been fine. Um, the limiter is me and my legs and my cardio system, not the wheels themselves. They seem to spin just fine. They're rebranded DT Swiss hubs, I believe. The one thing I would like to have seen with this bike is a 19 mil inner track rather than a 17 mil standard inner track, just to blow the tire out a little bit more like the hunt wheels that I have had on the bike previously. I'll be getting a little bit more hands-on in the next few days with the wheels as I swap out the Garvia tires for the GP5000 tubeless. So I'll be looking forward to that. Also with the wheels, I have greased and oiled the through axles. Now this kind of sounds a bit weird, but when you screw a through axle in, the last few turns can be a little bit grippy or grindy. I have put just a little bit of oil on the, um, the O-ring on the outside so you can torque them up just fine with none of that grinding feel. So not sure whether that's a tip that anybody's ever shared or is a thing. I've done it on my bike. It's beautiful. Happy days. The Garvia 25mm tubeless tyres that came on the Giants haven't let me down. I've taken them through a few hairy descents over in Adelaide at the Tour Down Under on hot days and they've stuck on the bike and stuck me to the road, which is their job. No nicks or cuts. They do seem to deflate to 60 psi every day, so I'm not quite sure what's with that. It may be the sealant that's used, but not a problem. They'll be coming off the bike shortly and the GP5000 TLs going on. Having a look at the wear, the front still has the front groove or the line in it, so that's got quite a few thousand Ks left in it. And the rear wheel, still good to go. Thousands of Ks still left in that. Just checking the chain wear here in multiple spots, and it's still looking pretty good after, well, it's over 1,500 kilometers now, so that's all happy days. I have been riding in pretty good conditions though. Other miscellaneous things with the bike, uh, installing it on a trainer with Synchro 1 or 2, so semi-synchro or full synchro is a bit of a pain in the ass because you can't get the bike into the 3911. It sticks in the one or two gears up higher from that. So I usually put a bike into the lowest gear, smallest ring on the front so you know where everything's lined up, but it won't go there in synchro. So a bit of a pain in the ass, but if there's ever been a first world problem with bikes, that's one of them. The giant Power Pro power meter on the bike was dropping out in sprints early on, so I really wasn't happy with that, and I wasn't going to do a review of a unit that may have been broken. The latest firmware update from that did fix the sprints, and if you saw my latest video on how I compare power meters, it was front and center there with data compared to the Neo2 and the Asiomas. It was reading a little high, but the data is going straight over the giant. They'll review that, we'll get some more information, and I'll do a specific video on that coming soon. So there it is, after six weeks and after 1500 kilometers on the bike, it's been pretty good so far. A few tips and tricks I've picked up along the way. Stopping that creak on the seat post was a good thing. Creaking bikes are never really good. Finding out about that front caliper that can be switched to a 160 mm rotor, that was pretty cool. And the slight small modifications that I've made so far with the wireless module and the climbing shifter were well worth doing. Follow my tutorials, links below to those. Alrighty, I'll leave it there. I'm off to install these GP5000 tubeless tires. Tubeless, what could go wrong?